Okay, guys, let us test this out here. Oh. Let's meet Bailey. This is Bailey. Look up here, Bailey. Look up here, buddy. He's half Siamese and he is full of spunk. Thanks, Bailey. He also meows incessantly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Colin Talks Crypto with me, your host, Colin. Let's start off today, before we dive into the plethora of EOS news, let's just start off with this. Bam, $1 million. This bill, obviously fake, is what could happen and I think inevitably will happen to the American dollar in enough time. And this would be a direct result of inflation. I think at this point it would be hyperinflation. And I just, I got this today and I decided, you know what? This is a good reminder of why we are in crypto. This is what crypto secures for us is the safety from this we can be safe from it with our crypto assets. I just wanted to share that with you guys. Thought you could appreciate that. It's actually really well done. Here's the back of it as well. Looks quite real. I'm, I might try to buy something with this in the store. I'll see what they give me for it. Okay, so today, bringing you a lot of news in EOS. It seems like there's really not a day goes by that there's a bunch of new stuff happening. It is a brand new blockchain, so there's tons of activity happening on a daily basis. Um, due to the popularity of my last EOS Mega Update, I am going to continue this. This is EOS Mega Update Volume 2. So um, Block 1 has released a couple of statements, all recently here. A proposal for a new EOS constitution, constitution version 2.0, which is actually rather surprising because we just launched the entire blockchain about two weeks ago, and uh, it has a constitution that everyone agreed upon uh, via voting. And it turns out that it might not have been going so smoothly. The ECAF kind of got out of control. The number of arbitration orders got out of control. It seems like basically everything turned into a claim or an arbitration and so Dan is clearly not happy about this. And so he has basically put forth the idea that he wants to scrap the entire constitution and start fresh with a more code is law approach. There's a several different points to this new constitution, but the most important one, in my opinion, is the entrance of a more code is law viewpoint versus before where it was more of code is not law and the human element is the deciding factor in how the blockchain should be run and we should not be run by robotic computerized decisions and uh, it looks like we're backpedaling on that a little bit based on the actual reality of what happened in the early starting days of eos and um, i think he's probably correct on this and so he wrote this article or block one wrote this article and essentially he, in, in layman's terms, the change is that we can still have arbitration, but it's based purely upon contracts. If the contract is supposed to run a certain way and the contract doesn't run the way that the programmer intended, the intent of the contract can be enforced via arbitration. However, claims to lost private keys, lost money, lost funds, stolen money, scammed money, Dan is actually saying that he does not want to support that anymore because he's saying it's doing more harm than good to the community. And I see what he's saying because it gives a very bad impression when suddenly the block producers or the ECAF are freezing left and right. It gives a very insecure feeling to the blockchain and a very mutable feeling to the blockchain. And a blockchain, I mean, historically, that's been one of its main strengths is being immutable being unchangeable. It's a permanent record, something that can't be alterable. Everything else in society run by governments and banks and all these things that we're trying to escape from have the problem of centralized mutability, meaning that the numbers can be changed. The government can come in and freeze your bank account. The government can come in and alter some numbers. They can print money out of thin air, things like this. And I mean, basically, it seemed like we were heading that direction with the previous first 
version of the Constitution. And so I think he's making a very smart move. We're sort of drawing a middle line so that if something like the Ethereum DAO hack happens or exploit happens, then there is recourse because that contract, that smart contract, wasn't performing as expected. And so that's something that arbitration would have jurisdiction on. And instead of splitting the network into two forks, like with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, arbitration at that point, under the new EOS Constitution version 2.0, could freeze that particular contract and redeploy it as corrected so that it runs properly. But if you know Bob down the street gets hacked for 10,000 EOS, he's not going to get that money back. That money is lost just like on every other immutable blockchain. So, however, I am kind of wondering how lost private keys is going to be handled because I think what he's mentioned is that there's going to be an optional contract where if you want to put your EOS tokens into this contract, there's sort of like the two flavors of EOS all on the same blockchain. And you can keep your EOS tokens on the raw original form of EOS and you will have no um, recourse due to lost private keys, lost things like that, being scammed. There's no recourse on that. However, on the second part of this same blockchain, but with this smart contract, you can actually then at that point enter into arbitration and have um, recourse for things like lost keys, stolen keys, etc. So the user himself will have the choice to put his tokens where he wants to, depending on the level of security that he wants or doesn't want. Or if he just wants it completely immutable and doesn't want any kind of recourse, he can stay with that part of the EOS blockchain. So this is going to be very interesting to see how this rolls out. Um, that's my understanding of it at this point. Okay, so let's get into this article. So it's entitled Block One's Proposal for EOS Constitution Version 2.0. The EOS community has embarked on a revolutionary journey to combine the best aspects of crypto contracts, human contracts, and human dispute resolution. The decentralized birth of a new public blockchain and governance system is fundamentally challenging because everyone is trying to figure out the rules. Some people want to replicate existing legal structures. Others want to regulate all manner of behavior, while others want to retain code is law. Block One has watched the community launch an EOSIO based blockchain and has learned important lessons from the experience. They're admitting that maybe they didn't have it just right at the beginning, and maybe there's some room for improvements or tweaks or a complete overhaul, as we're going to see here. And so code as law is what Bitcoin and Ethereum offer. They offer immutability, right? If the code executed a certain way, then that's what the outcome is. And there's no room for humans to come in and say, oh, sorry, actually, that's not the case. So here's the paragraph called the importance of code as law. The single most compelling feature of code as law is the removal of any room for dispute. All contractual terms are expressed in the code, which will execute predictably for all parties in the absence of bugs or extraordinary situations. EOS IO, however, was created with the recognition that bugs slash extraordinary events will happen and that the community needs a process to establish the intent of smart contracts in order to quickly resolve issues in a transparent and predictable way when they do occur. So that's like talking about how when an Ethereum DAO hack happens, then we need to be able to handle that kind of a thing. And moving on here, a need for objective boundaries. Users of any blockchain need some guarantees from the community in order to feel safe and secure. If everything on the blockchain is subject to majority opinion, then an unreasonable amount of predictability is lost. Further, if the community does not have strong objective organizing principles, then everything is subject to interpretation and becomes unacceptably arbitrary. And I think that's what we were seeing with the first version of the Constitution. Therefore, Block 1 suggests ending all protocol-level arbitration orders, other than to render non-binding opinions on the intent of the code. We believe the elected block producers should be the jury and must render a two-thirds plus one decision to alter a broken contract. Generally speaking, the only contract that producers should be fixing is the system contract, the one that manages the core token, staking, resources, and voting. Contract developers have the ability and should define their own processes for fixing bugs and updating their own contracts. This means that the elected block producers have the same power as demonstrated by the large mining pools in previous instances of intervention, such as the DAO hack, 
With EOS IO software, this intervention process can be formalized and is ultimately in the hands of the token voters, rather than being informal and in the hands of hash power voters. And in the section Lost and Stolen Keys, they say, The purpose of private keys is to generate objective proof of ownership. If the network cannot rely on signatures alone, then it must rely upon identity and subjective interpretations of intent. This is not feasible, as it will open up an unsustainable level of disputes and new kinds of fraud and or injustice. And that's an interesting line because that's actually pretty much exactly what Nick Sosbo, if you remember from the first video I did, talked about. He tweeted about how the arbitration would not be scalable, essentially. And I think that basically Block 1 is admitting that that's the case. It would open up an unsustainable level of disputes. EOSIO was written from the ground up to provide the infrastructure required to truly protect and recover accounts on an opt-in basis. And so they talk about how there'll be support for Apple, Android, and smart card devices, which means basically fingerprint or facial recognition to secure the private keys. And so he goes into more about the opt-in part of this. There are different ways to protect against fraud and private key theft. One way is to opt in to a banking contract that controls the tokens on behalf of owners. Transfers within the smart contract are subject to dispute resolution, where the contract appointed arbitrators have the power to reverse transactions and freeze tokens. Withdrawals from the banking smart contract are subject to a three day or longer delay, after which they cannot be reversed. Those who want the elected block producers and or ECAF to protect their interests could opt in to a new smart contract where the ECAF slash producers are the arbitration system. So basically block one and Dan are proposing that EOS becomes very customizable. And I like that it, it becomes custom to what you want to use it as. As I said earlier, if you want to have maximum security, then you can have that. If you want to have maximum flexibility, you can have that. If you want to have recoverability, you can have that. If you want to just have code as law, you can have that. And I think that's great. It's all built on the same blockchain. And that way, the base blockchain isn't deciding it for everyone. Users can decide on an individual basis. And it probably should have been this way from day one. But again, block one is learning as they go here, just like all of us. All right, and then moving right along to the second article that block one put out on the same day. This is entitled, Block One's Participation as Voting EOS Community Member. That's interesting. As you remember, Block One has not up until this point voted with any of their tokens. They own one-tenth of the entire supply and they have not voted once. They own 100 million tokens. It says, as a recipient of the 10% of the initial EOS token allocation, Block One recognizes its responsibility to participate as an active minority voting member. I find it interesting how they throw the word minority in there. Like, yeah, sure, they're a minority because they've got only one-tenth, only one-tenth, right? But one-tenth of the tokens is an enormous, enormous amount. And I'll show you why that's such an enormous amount in a second when we flip over to how many tokens are actually voting currently. And then we'll compare how much that 10% is in relation to that. But either way, basically Block One's coming out and saying, hey, you know what? We've got tokens. We're going to vote with them. And it's completely within their right. There's nothing stopping them from doing so. It does put them in a very strong position to dictate or control the narrative and where the blockchain is heading. However, there's nothing to stop anyone else from voting. So um, there are 90% of other tokens. And if they get off their butts and vote, then um, Block One's can be less significant. And so down here, basically, it says the following are the values and considerations that will guide Block One's participation in the block producer election process. And they name the points that they would like to see in block producers, such as honesty, integrity and fairness, transparency of identity, activities and decision making, um, abiding by smart contracts and programming of network participants, 24 seven timeliness and processing transactions. As you remember, there was a block producer, I think its name was EOS Store, who failed to uphold or a decision that was made for a couple days, and it resulted in a theft of some money from a user. And um, they just had some excuse like, oops, sorry, I had some private matters to attend to. And meanwhile, they're making nearly $10,000 per day in EOS tokens. And so their excuse is really not acceptable. I think that uh, they may get voted out here by block one is my guess. If 100 million tokens go voting for block producers with this list, I'm going to think they're not going to pick that particular block producer. And I'm glad, actually, because I don't want to see 
I don't want a block producer that's not even going to attend meetings and is only a one-man operation. If you're getting paid $10,000 per day, you can afford to hire a small staff to make sure you have 24-7 operations. It's the least you can do to honestly uphold the EOS blockchain with resilience and reliability. And then lastly, we have compliance with Ricardian contracts, and we have alignment with the EOS constitution. So it looks strongly like Block 1 is basically saying, you know what, we're going to carry some weight here. We are going to vote for block producers that meet our requirements, one of which is that the block producer is using our new version 2 constitution. So if you're not using our constitution, then you're not going to get voted for. So basically, they're saying, do what we say or else. And it says, we are steadfast in our commitment to the above values and optimistic that our participation will positively impact the EOS network. And there is a guarantee that EOS is going to do things in the best interest of the blockchain because block one doesn't get the entire 100 million EOS tokens up front. They only get 10% of the tokens every year for the next 10 years. So they have a vested interest for at least the next 10 years to be acting benevolently for the network. To point fingers at them and say that they're going to do some crazy stuff that hurts the network would be pretty asinine because they have a vested interest in it doing well. Their own future token supply is dependent upon the network doing well. Their own paycheck in EOS is dependent upon how awesome the blockchain is. So I think we're actually pretty safe there. But again, I would very much like to see a larger turnout of voters so that Block 1's votes are, are balanced out. So that's their second article. And then let's just get some comments on, on what we see there. So this guy named Eric from Twitter here said that Block 1 has decided to take over BP voting by using their 10% stack. So Block 1 can now single-handedly pick the BP list for EOS. And uh, actually, currently, that is true based on the current turnout of votes. And I'll show you that right here. So this is eostracker.io slash producers. And we're taking a look at the top 21 block producers. And let's just look at the number one. It has 60 million votes. So let's think about that for a second. If block one has 100 million votes, of which they can vote with from the beginning, they may only receive 10 million tokens per year as their paycheck, but they get to vote with the full weight from day one. And so right now they can vote with 100 million. Basically, they can vote into existence any block producer they want. They could completely switch this up if they wanted to. And they get 30 votes. As you know, every voter gets 30 votes with their full token holder weight. So if I have, for example, if I have 50,000 EOS tokens, I get to vote 30 times, up to 30 times. And each one of those votes carries that 50,000 EOS vote weight. So in Block 1's case, they have up to 30 votes that can carry 100 million EOS tokens of voting weight, which is huge. So it completely dwarfs any of the votes that are currently on here. Basically, they would be making the decisions. Uh, and one way of looking at it is it may encourage more voting to occur because if everyone goes, hey, Block One's votes are more than everyone else's combined, then maybe we should start voting. And there's nothing stopping the community aside from laziness or technical know-how to themselves vote. And I, I really encourage everyone to vote and cast some opinion on what should the current block producers be. But um, yeah, we'll just have to see how it goes. I would much rather see the community be picking those personally. And here's another comment on it. So this is from Mistrustless on Reddit. He says, I made the point on another thread. With their voting power, Block One can absolutely force BPs to upgrade their software or upgrade the constitution to their will. Neither Bitcoin Core nor the Ethereum Foundation can force the network to run updates. Block One has centralized power beyond any other blockchain comparison. And this person, Celso Martinho, <laughs> replies, If you want to get technical, then Bitcoin and Ethereum mining pools have way more power than Block One. Bitmain alone is quickly reaching the 51% hash power rate. Let's not forget this. I guess the point is, are we better off with the founding members having a little more power to kickstart things the right way until there's better wealth distribution and voting participation? Or do we prefer Ethereum Classic or Bitcoin Cash? So we'll have to see how this goes. And um, I can see pros and cons to it, just like these two guys are pointing out here. All right, guys, let us move right on along here. 
to eosauthority.com slash alerts, you'll see that EOS Authority has offered a very cool service where you can enter your account name and your email address, and you'll be notified if any of these things happen. Incoming and outgoing transfers, changes or addition to the keys, airdrops sent to the account, actions authorized by the account, and any ECAF arbitration notices. So this is a great way to stay informed. You wouldn't want your tokens to be transferred out of your account without your knowledge. And now you can be emailed instantly when any of that happens. So this is a really good security measure. I actually recommend everyone signs up for this because who has the time to sit there and monitor their account manually every single day? I have something similar set up like this with my Ethereum key. And so anytime that I get like an airdrop or if I receive some Ethereum, I just get an email and I don't have to like keep my eye on my accounts and I find it really, really useful. So I know that this for a fact is gonna be a very useful service. There was a post on Reddit claiming that EOS Google Trends was actually starting to surpass the Ethereum Google Trends. And yeah, sure enough, it looks like EOS is climbing above. So actually this is a bit of false news because when I loaded up Google Trends, as you'll see here, um, here's the lines. This is one year worth of data. But if you click back to past five years, you'll notice something interesting that the red line, which is EOS, goes all the way back to 2013. So EOS is probably referring to something else. It might be, as one user jokingly said, it might be referring to EOS Canon, Canon EOS, a model of camera, um, but it's, it's definitely not referring to the blockchain of EOS, at least not all of this data, because EOS didn't even exist until um, late 2017. So all of this over here is not relating to EOS. Sorry to say it, but this is not EOS overcoming Ethereum. All right. And lastly, I wanted to share two websites on the subject of EOS RAM. So EOS New York puts out a very cool site. This is EOSRP.io. This is the EOS Resource Planner website. And it tells you the current price of RAM, which right now it's 0.1119 EOS per kilobyte which equates to approximately 83.4 cents US dollars per kilobyte. And it also gives you the price of the CPU price and the network price. And there's another website here, which is also very useful. This is feeexplorer.io slash EOS underscore RAM underscore price. This is the EOS RAM price history. And this is great because it has a graph, as you see here. And this graph shows that the price has been steadily climbing there's been a lot of speculation happening right now because EOS has a built-in RAM market where you can buy and sell RAM and there's a fee for doing so, but you can actually trade it and make a profit or a loss on your EOS, depending on if the price of RAM per kilobyte goes up or down. And um, I heard of a couple block producers that are speculating on this and driving the price up with their daily rewards, which seems not cool to me, um, but it is a free market, so there's nothing to stop them. And there was actually a really interesting story of a guy who, we don't know who it is, but you can just see the account where basically he started with approximately 30,000 EOS and early on on this graph, buying that RAM and holding it, he then flipped it into 90,000 EOS. So he made a huge profit, about a half a million dollars of profit in a five day period by just buying RAM with his EOS and then selling the RAM. So I would have loved him in that guy, but, um, when mainstream starts catching on to things like that, and you're at the kind of the top of the peak, kind of like we're seeing here, I personally would stay away from that. Um, you never know which way it's gonna head. The block producers could add more RAM, which would then increase the supply and drop the price, and then you would lose money on this. And just more people are aware of it. So it may have been wise when it first came to the surface, but, and who knows? I mean, it could go up a lot more. Maybe RAM will just get completely scarce and go skyrocket high. No one can tell you. But I think that just based on the fact that this is becoming more known in the news arenas, um, I would stay away from it personally. I think it's a good way to potentially lose a lot of money quickly. Again, we'll find out what happens with this. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you very much for your likes and your subscribes. I really appreciate it. I'm a new channel and I'm growing as fast as I possibly can. And I just love reading about crypto and bringing the news to you fresh. And remember, get your money into at least get, you know, 5% of your wealth into crypto or more. I want to make sure that everyone I know has some money in crypto so that you are safe from this happening.
Okay, guys, have a great day. Talk to you later. Peace.